Shalom from here in the Holy Land. Welcome to Conversations with Yael Podcast. I'm your host, Yael Eckstein, President and CEO of the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. Each month, I will invite leading thought leaders, pastors, rabbis, and other influential guests to discuss the importance of Israel in the world today. For those familiar with my weekly podcast, Nourish Your Biblical Roots, which explores the Jewish roots of the Christian faith, this podcast takes that understanding and translates it into ongoing support for Israel among Christians and the critical need to nurture that support with the next generation of Christians. Join me now as we begin this important dialogue. This is a year of celebrating milestone anniversaries. The fellowship is celebrating 40 years of serving the Jewish people with its Christian supporters and friends, and Israel is celebrating 75 years since the founding of the Jewish state in the aftermath of World War II and the Holocaust. With that in mind, as we celebrate Israel and all she has contributed to the world on so many different fronts, I welcome to the podcast our distinguished guest, Israeli Ambassador Ido Aharoni. Throughout his extensive career as a diplomat in Israel's longest serving council general in New York, Ambassador Aroni has dedicated his life work to building bridges between Israel and the world. He currently serves as Global Distinguished Professor for International Relations at NYU's Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. He's a member of the International Advisory Council of APCO Worldwide and a Global Ambassador for the Maccabi World Union. Following his 25-year career as a veteran of Israel's foreign service, Ambassador Aharoni founded the Brand Israel Program and was named head of Israel's first brand management program. Born and raised in Jaffa, his parents were part of the generation of Israelis to fight for and welcome the newly independent state of Israel. Ambassador Aharoni also served in the IDF and was an infantry commander during the first Lebanon war. This career in public service to Israel, while building bridges and friendship with her neighbors worldwide, is certainly in line with the fellowship's mission. So I am incredibly excited to speak with Ambassador Aharoni today. Ambassador Aharoni, welcome to my podcast. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And thank you for your your kind introduction. (laughs) Well, I could have gone on a lot longer, but we had to shorten it a bit. So I had to condense your many years of service into just a few paragraphs. But we're going to get to so much of that today, which I'm really looking forward to. When we got on the call earlier, you were saying how you're sitting in your home in Israel, a home that you bought many years ago, and then were living abroad for uh, so long in service to Israel. Um, but you're one of the few people, actually, Israel's made up of Olim. I'm uh, Ole, a new immigrant from America, and you actually were born in Israel. Can you tell us a little bit about that upbringing of being raised in Israel that was very different than the Israel that we know today? Right, right. Uh, so my uh, my family came to this part of the world many, many years ago. Uh, my father's side of the family settled in Jerusalem in the 1870s. They came from a region in Central Asia known as Bukhara. Uh, today, we know the Jews of Bukhara mostly as merchants, diamond dealers, jewelry dealers, rug dealers, and so on. Um, but back in the day, they were very affluent. They came to Jerusalem. And they founded one of the first neighborhoods outside of the old city known until this very day as Shkunat Bukharim, the Bukharian Quarter. And that's where my father was raised. That's where my grandfather was born. My grandmother was born there. And so our family's roots from my father's side begin in uh, the third quarter of the 19th century. My mother's family came from Yemen and they settled in Tel Aviv in right after Tel Aviv was established. Uh, Tel Aviv was established in 1909. My family settled in Tel Aviv in 1912. My mom was born 20 years later in 1932 in Tel Aviv, and so was I and my siblings. And we were raised in the city of Cholon, which was a southern suburb of Tel Aviv. I was born in Yafo, Jaffa. Um, and, And Israel was small. Look, when I was born, only two and two and a half million Israelis. Today, we're close to 10 million, and we're projected to be 18 million by the time we celebrate 100 years. That's an unprecedented uh, level of growth when you look at the Western world, unprecedented. And so, obviously, um, the the 
numbers change the nature of, of the country. So, for example, when I was growing up, there was no television. Um, my, my parents bought their first TV set when I was 14 years old. They bought their first car when I was 15 years old. And by the way, when they did buy their first TV set, this is for our viewers and our listeners in mostly in North America, where they had color TV from the 1950s, right? In Israel, we didn't have color TV until the late 1980s. And the one TV channel that we had was very limited in the number of hours of broadcast. So when uh, when we first got our, our TV set, I remember there were maybe five hours a night of broadcast. And the the content that came was mostly from uh, United States and and uh, and England, and shows like Bonanza, All in the Family, and from England it was mostly uh, British uh, football, soccer as we call it. So that was uh, the Israel that I grew up in. Uh, everybody lived in the same small apartments. Um, there was no real. Um, wealth in the country at the time. Uh, there were a couple of wealthy families, but there were nothing like what you have today. Um, the economy was based mostly on agriculture. The number one export brand was Jaffa oranges. Uh, later on, it became more security related, was more Uzi submachine gun, but only in the 1990s, Israel started to emerge as a technology uh, superpower. Uh, and life science superpower, but that didn't exist when I was a kid. Um, and then 1973, which was a big trauma, the Yom Kippur War, there were three and a half million Israelis um, in 1973. So those were those were the days. Wow. So the times have changed so much. And did you learn your incredible English from those five hours of American broadcasting a day? <laughs> well, thank you so much for your compliment. I learned my English, believe it or not, from music. Back in the day, um, you bought a, an album, a record, and it usually came with the lyrics. And um, and I I um, I used to listen to songs and look at the lyrics at the same time, sing together with the. But the problem was that all my teachers were from England, my English teachers, and the music that I liked was American. Was mostly you know. I used to listen to musicians like, uh, well, some of them, I later learned that they were Canadian, uh, like, uh, but I didn't know that at the time. Like, I thought Gordon Gordon Lightfoot was an American singer, uh, so I would sing, uh, if you could read my mind, right? I thought it was an American uh, song. It was a Canadian. Leonard Cohen was Canadian. Neil Young, Bob Dylan. Those were the musicians. Cat Stevens. Those were the musicians that I grew up listening to, and also some some British uh, classic uh, uh, rock bands like, you know, the Moody Blues, the Beatles, of course, and so on. That's how I learned my English. And so when I used sentences from the American lyrics, like, I ain't going to work at Maggie's Farm no more. <laughs> and, in a, you know, and my teacher from England she she couldn't tolerate it. And she told me that I'm using English that um, is unacceptable. So I wasn't a great student because I used the language that I learned from the from the songs. But that's how I learned my English, not from movies or television, from music. That is amazing. And I think that any English teacher today, by the way the kids learn English based on the songs today, your music sounded pretty good. <laughs> when I hear the yeah, and, music today, and by the I way, cringe. And 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 the and there were the you know the um the record producers were sensitive to the fact that words have meaning, and so they really made an effort to attach the lyrics to every record, which is something that you don't see today anymore. Yeah, you're actually the second person this week of leaders in Israel to say that they learned English through music. I was just uh, earlier this week with the Minister of Welfare and who was also speaking uh, 
relatively good English. And I said, where did you learn your English? He said, well, the first, up until I was in high school, I didn't really speak any English. And then I had a teacher who taught me through song because during all the classes, I just couldn't absorb the English classes. And she taught me a song, save my kisses for you. And through that song, I knew every single word. I knew how to read it. I knew how to understand it. I knew all the different uh, ways to even pronounce it correctly, like an American. So it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting trend, I think think that there was a certain time where is Israel that was in a way disconnected from so much of the modern world and modern technology through song was able to learn English and culture, which is a very cool thing. And it remember it reminds me, um, uh, Ambassador Aroni, that uh where I live now, I live in a small town up north. And apparently my house now we're a big city with over 50,000 residents, but my house was the first small makolet, a small store. Mm for milk and uh, bread and just the basics, a, a little market in, in our town. And people always tell me that there, was, there wasn't even a road in front. And the way that they would get their goods each week would come on the back of a, a horse and a carriage. So every week there'd be a horse and a carriage that would come and drop off the milk and the cheese and all the different items. And there was two community cars that if someone had to go to the hospital or give birth, then they would use those community cars. That there's something very um, nostalgic about those days also, wouldn't you say? Yes, yes. But, you know, um, we have a tendency, nostalgia is a tricky thing because we have a tendency to remember only the good things. But there were Romanticize some it, yeah. Romanticizing. Yeah, I think that Israel is doing extremely well. Yeah. We're about to celebrate our 75th birthday. And it's important for our listeners, especially uh, those who are interested in the in the history of Christianity with Israel, with this part of the world, that 1948 was technically the year Israel's independence was proclaimed. But the efforts to establish a Jewish homeland started maybe a century earlier yeah. than 1948. In fact, when we count our dead, as we will do very soon in Israel, Yom HaZikaron, which is a sacred day in Israeli culture, we begin the count in 1860. Why 1860 and not 1948? When you look at the Ministry of Defense, their list of Israeli fatalities and casualties begin in 1860. And the reason is because 1860 is known as the year when the Jews came out of the walls of the old city and established with the help of Sir Moses Montefiore, who was the biggest Jewish philanthropist of his time, the first Jewish neighborhood called Yemin Moshe. That's when the friction with the Arabs started. And, and that friction um, translated later and mushroomed into what we call today the Israeli-Arab slash Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But it started way back then. Mm -hmm. And there were, even earlier than 1860, there were attempts of Christians, some of them from the United States, that came and tried to establish life in Israel, in that part of, of the world. Most famously, um, the community called Hopeville, which was established in Tel Aviv in 1853 with the uh, Steinbach family. Uh, that ended tragically with um, uh, rioting and, and, and a massacre. And, uh, and even before that, President Martin Van Buren, was a first term, one term president, 1837 to 1841. He appointed in 1840, the first American consul general, who was a devout Christian, who came to first Tel Aviv and then Jerusalem in 1840, converted to Judaism. In fact, after he retired from his post as consul general in Jerusalem, he moved back to the States and he died as a Jew. I think his Jewish name was uh, Tevye or something like that. And uh, I think he moved to Florida at the time. But the, the history yeah. of America's ties with Israel goes back way before Israeli independence. 
That is so fascinating. And we know even a little bit more modern, but in Basel with uh, at the big assembly there, there were 10 evangelical Christians as well that um, Herzl saw that this was a part not only of biblical prophecy coming to fruition for the Jewish people, but that uh, Christians also saw the relevance of the establishment of the state of Israel. And for the first time maybe in history that we've been able to have these strategic friends and partners in keeping uh, the country safe and in, in so many different ways. Um, and so and by the way, for yeah. our, our our listeners who are interested in, in literature, the book East of Eden written by John Steinbeck is based on the trauma that his Christian family experienced here in the Holy Land in what is today Tel Aviv. It, in fact, it's the, the heart of Tel Aviv today. And they planted a sycamore tree, which is still there. So to our um, our, our friends in America, I urge you when you come to Israel, go and visit that sycamore tree that was planted by what was then the Steinbach family, later on became Steinbeck, that produced John Steinbeck, who was a, uh, who won the Nobel Prize in Literature, was a great author, screenwriter. He himself came to visit that tree planted by his family in 1965, when I was three years old. Wow. He came out and and I there's there are pictures of him standing right next to that tree. And that tree is there for you to visit right now. So beautiful. I know when I go to Yad Vashem and go through that experience, then come out to the 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 trees of righteous of the nations. What my father used to always say of blessed memory was today, if we would plant a tree for every one of the righteous of the nations who stands with Israel, we would thank God we would have a huge forest. So you get to see the difference from one tree and how that stands out to many trees planted at Yad Vashem that today we have forests planted by uh, friends of Israel, which is which is no. Uh, not something to take lightly nor for granted. When we were talking, Ambassador, a little bit before we went live on this pat podcast, I said there's so much positivity, there's so many um, exciting things happening in support for Israel that despite all the bleak news, I actually see a lot of light. And you said, yeah, El, there is so much hope, there is so much light, there is so much excitement happening now when we look at the future of Israel. When you think of the future of Israel and you have that wonderful and unique positive outlook, what comes to mind? So the first thing is we have to understand how did we get here, Yeah. right? Israel is a miracle. There's no question about it. And what are the reasons for the miracle? Uh, because no other nation was able to do what our nation was able to do. Not only when you look at survival, the story of the survival of the Jewish people, how did, I mean, and if you think about throughout history, every major empire in every civilization, the Jews were used of trying to rule the world and someone was trying to kill the Jews in every generation. It's insane. And yet here we are and the Roman Empire is, you can read about them in the history books, but they no longer exist. And all those who try to destroy us are not there anymore. Yeah. And the question is why? There are two explanations that I think are the key to Israel's success today. The first is, and, and nothing that I say is my own original idea. These are things that other people researched and validated and confirmed. So the first thing is that there's something about the DNA of the Jewish people um, that is the key to the understanding of not only their survivability, but also their success. And that is the refusal to accept limitations. Hmm. The refusal to accept limitations is part of the DNA of the Jewish people. And it starts with Abraham's permission to argue with God continues until this very day with the culture of debate. And so when a lot of people see debates, political debates in Israel, and they say, oi vey, what are the Israelis? I mean, they, they see bad news. Where What I see is actually a very healthy debate, a debate that emanates from tension, and tension exists in every immigrant society, whether it's in Chicago or in Toronto or in any place where you have immigrants and you bring them together, there's tension. But that tension is, is what creates the magic, right? There was tension between John Lennon and Paul McCartney. Great deal of tension. We know that. But look at what that tension created. Yeah. It was a great tension between Magic Johnson and Larry Bird. But look <laughs> at what that created, right? And so there's tension between groups in Israel, and that's great. It's, you know, we just need to make sure it doesn't turn into violence, which it didn't so far. But 
that tension creates creativity. That creativity is the engine of Israeli prosperity. So that's the first thing that I would say. The second thing is um, Israelis are, the Jewish people and Israelis are continuing that tradition is a nation of storytellers. And stories, by definition, inspire people. When you look at the role of Jewish people punching way above their weight, right? The Jews are 0.2%, 0.02% of the global population. And yet, when you look at their contribution to humankind, the Jews are punching way above their weight. And the reason is because they are being viewed as inspirational in every dimension of life, whether it's in culture, in science, in even in politics and business, they're being viewed as inspirational. And I think that this is what the world sees in Israel. So if we take the the, the view from above Beautiful. about what's happening in Israel, I think that those assets are still there. I think they will be there forever in terms of this is who we are. This is our DNA as a nation. Yeah. And regardless of what is happening in the political sphere, I think that Israel will continue to thrive. And as I mentioned before, we are expected to become a nation of 18 million people by 2048. That's a big country. Yeah, that's a big country that cherishes life because because uh, I think one of the highest birth rates in the world, coupled with what you wouldn't expect, is one of the happiest nations in the world. So when you are expanding the family and you're being raised in a happy culture, I think both of those points are very relevant and really do give so much hope for the future. Um, ambassadors, Israel's first had a brand management. You said, let me quote, no place, no person, no organization wishes to be solely defined by its problems. Every place has a DNA, a personality, just like a human being. What do you see as how uh, the brand has evolved of Israel over the past 75 years? What words would you use to describe Israel from a brand management point of view? And what do you see in the years ahead as being Israel's strongest brand as we try to uh, spread this beautiful message and those two defining characteristics that you described to the world? So, um, you know, what defines Israel and will continue to define is the exceptional creative spirit of the Israeli people. Uh, some people call it startup nation. I think startup nation is a very limited view of Israeli creativity, only in high tech, but Israeli creativity is manifested in all areas of life, from the Israeli cuisine, to the Israeli canvas, to the Israeli dance floor, and even to the way you raise money to help the Israelis like you do day in and day out, very creative. And so um, creativity and the creative spirit of our people, which is inspirational on the one hand, and, and, and of course, is galvanizing, brings people together on the other. Um, here's the thing. For decades, and, and my work is not done, unfortunately. For decades, Israel tried to defy the very basic rules of marketing. What is the number one rule of marketing? The, let's say I want to sell this bottle to you. First thing I need to know is, what is the value proposition? What is the relative advantage of this product? And then once I understand what are the qualities of this product, my job is to communicate those qualities to the relevant audiences, right? That's marketing. Yeah. Now what Israel tried to do, and understandably because Israel was under attack, what Israel tried to do is to market itself through its problems, which mm -hmm. stands against the very basic rules of marketing. You cannot market a place, a country, by highlighting its problems all the time. It means that the only people that will visit you or the only people that will invest their money in you, the only people that will develop curiosity in you will be the people that feel sorry for you, mm. which has been the case. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. Many good Jews and many good Christians you know, connected with Israel on that background. However, when you want to grow and you want to establish a powerful brand, you need to be relevant to people beyond the people that feel sorry for you yeah. or feel committed to you for whatever reason, if you want to build new audiences. And we even see that today when we look, and, and I'm looking, I'm talking about this after looking at research, 
even in the younger generation of people, when you look at the younger generation of evangelical Christians, when you look at the younger Orthodox Jews in America, when you look at younger people all over the world, you know, the connection their parents had to Israel, which their parents and their grandparents took for granted, is not being taken for granted by them. What does it mean? It means that we, the Israelis, have to work harder to connect with them. We have to make an extra effort to connect with them. And how do we make that effort? By showing them how Israel can be relevant to their life, not the other way around. Yeah. And so we need to turn. There's a new formula. Israel has to make the effort. Israel has to put in the effort to communicate itself, its qualities, and most importantly, how Israel is relevant to people's lives. Uh, when people that um, battle cancer uh, will know that the breakthroughs are coming from Israeli scientists, it will change their position. When people will know that, um, you know, the, you know, um, I, I'm a, a big fan of television and, and I'm a big fan of, um, of, of movies and, and content. And I have to say that many people in the United States were completely unaware of the fact that some of the greatest content that they're consuming actually is originating from Israel. And it gave me a great joy and, and, and pleasure to bring this to their attention. And people were blown away. What do you, you, you mean... Homeland is based on an Israeli show. And what do you mean in treatment was based on an Israeli show? We had no idea. Um, and, and they enjoy Shtisel and they enjoy Fauda and they enjoy all sorts of other, And yeah. <laughs> uh, and they enjoy all those Israeli shows. And, and again, it's a big part of the brand. And, um, and it shows you the strength. Same thing goes for, for uh, other soft assets. Uh, but obviously, um, I think that when you look at what Israel has to offer the world, the sky's the limit in terms of what we can achieve. And it also, it shows in the numbers. We, when we started with the Brand Israel program uh, right after 9-11, there were maybe 500,000 tourists that came to Israel every year. Today, we're looking at over 5 million. So there's a big trajectory here. Amazing. And to point out that of those 5 million tourists to Israel, over 2.2 million of them are Christian. So it really appeals to this broad, vast Uchlusia uh, population and not just who you would consider the pro-Israel market. Um, and I think it's a really great point that in this point in Israel's history, we have to proactively create our story, not just as a response to the Holocaust or as a response to the terror, but what is the reason that we are here? What are we producing? Why do we enjoy being here? What I always say is I didn't pick up my family moved to Israel because of the politics. It was more in spite of the politics. So why are we marketing politics as everything that people associate with in Israel? Um, there's so much incredible, inspiring, personally relevant material coming out of Israel, whether it's in the uh, medical innovation field or whether it's in the inspiration field or the content and TV field, um, Israel is really a light into the world in so many areas that the more we can have people like you, Ambassador, showing that to the world in such an uh, inspiring way that really makes it relevant, I think the better we'll be and that will be uh, the future of Hasbara. Because at this point, I think Israel's friends, at least, know why we have to defend ourselves, but that's not the whole foundation of why they are our friends, that I think you make wonderful points that uh, so many people can learn from. You are, Ambassador, a very friendly person, easy to get along with, easy to speak to. You've met so many different figures in your life and in your long and expansive and impressive career. Is there any one uh, meeting with any sort of leader that you remember as just being either informative or hysterical or unexpected? A meeting that stands out to you that uh, when you look back at your many years as a diplomat, you just can't believe that really happened. <laughs> well, I attended so many unbelievable moments, really. Yeah. With um, When I joined, you have to understand how old I am. I, when I joined the Israeli government, the Israeli Foreign Service, the prime minister was Itzhak Shamir. <laughs> so that's how old I am. And I, I've seen them, you know, witnessed them all since then. Um, but you know what? Um, I'll tell you a story so that... Uh, 
you know, that puts things in perspective. So in 1992, um, I was accompanying the Israeli foreign minister, Shimon Peres, in New York. He came for the United Nations General Assembly, and Shimon Peres really was the kind of person that really liked to be embraced by the public. So whenever he had a chance, he would walk the streets of Manhattan. So that evening, we went to see a, a Broadway show uh, starring Marla Maples, uh, called uh, Sieg, Siegfried and the Follies. I think it was a short-lived Broadway musical. Um, and we were walking somewhere around Times Square. And, and of course, I was walking the back. It was a whole entourage, and Shimon Paris was walking there with surrounded by his security. And obviously, people on the street realize it's an important person uh, because he's surrounded by security. And so, um, so people took pictures of him and, and was one particular couple that wanted to have a picture taken with him. And they did. And, and the entourage continued to walk. And then as I was approaching these two people that took a picture, the couple, the elderly couple, the wife was asking the husband, who was that? Who did we take a picture with? And the husband said, you, don't you know that was it's Shamir? <laughs> and and it was really an epiphany for me because I realized that in this case it was Paris who was convinced that everybody knows who he is. I realized that we're not really at the center of the world. Yeah. And in fact, that we have to work very hard to make an impression and to be attractive. Mm -hmm. And it's not enough just to assume that everybody cares about us. We need to work hard to cultivate the relationships with our evangelical friends, with our Jewish friends, with our other friends. We have to work very hard at the maintenance of this relationship. And that to me was a moment, of course, we never said anything to Mr. Paris that the couple didn't even recognize who he was. They just assumed he was a famous person and they wanted to have a picture with him. Uh, but the same thing goes for, you know, most, with the exception of Moshe Dayan, who was- His really, eye patch gave it away. Exactly. Because of his eye patch, he was really almost a household name all over yeah. the world. Yeah. Uh, no Israeli, even David Ben-Gurion, even David Ben-Gurion, there, there are documents of the American Department of State. They didn't even know who he was. They, people knew Chaim Weizmann because he was the face of the Zionist movement because of his international diplomacy. He was the global face of the Zionist movement. But the Americans didn't really know David Ben-Gurion. Mm -hmm. Um, they thought that their, their documents um, uh, indicate that they thought he was a radical. They thought he was a terrorist. I'm talking about the U.S. Department of State, 1940s. Um, and, and of course, we think everybody knows who we are. Um, yeah, they've heard of Israel, but we need to make sure that they understand what value we bring to the table. That's the key. What is our proposition? Why is it important for you to be in touch with us? The onus is on us to prove that. I love that, Ambassador, because I think it's so spot on. Most of the world doesn't really know or care about Israel, and especially now with identity politics. I think most people have one issue that they really, really care about, and then they identify with the party who stands with their position on that one issue that they really know and care about. And then they adopt the rest of the issues of those parties. And so as the support for Israel becomes less bipartisan, the need to proactively tell the individual why they should care about Israel becomes more and more uh, critical, urgent, and uh, potentially even um a, a game changer for the future of Israel of if the next generation is going to want to be our friend or not, put it simply. And now, um, as we close our time together, this has been so informative to me and enjoyable, and you are such an inspiring individual. There's so much to teach in a way that actually could be uh, digested. I, I'm going to be able to give over so much of what you gave over to me. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, as we celebrate 75 years of Israel, what's your anniversary wish for Israel? And what do you see for the next 75 years? What, what I see for the next 75 years is tremendous growth mm -hmm. in all walks of life. Um, and the level of energy in this country is unbelievable. Every Israeli wants to make a contribution. 
Um, my, my main concern is that we will be successful integrating fully into the Israeli society um, the two sectors that are right now not part of the Israeli uh, miracle, we'll call it the economic and the, um, because Israel, this is very important for our listeners to understand. Israel is a knowledge-based economy. What does it mean a knowledge-based economy? Our main asset is intangible. It's not oil, it's not gold, it's something intangible. It's here. And we need to bring in all the sectors in Israeli society to be part of that effort, to be part of that celebration. And so we have right now two sectors that we need to make sure that they come in. First is, of course, uh, what is popularly referred to as the ultra-Orthodox. They do work, about 50% of ultra-Orthodox men work part of the labor market, but the problem is that they work within their own community. And we need them to be the scientists of the future. We need them to be, you know, the doctors of the future. And of course, the other sector is the Arabs. If we are able, and, and, and with the Arab sector, the problem is especially women employment. Um, and if we are able in the next 75 years to bring these two sectors into the system that produces knowledge, that produces the great breakthroughs, then I can't even begin to, you know, my imagination doesn't even... Uh, you know, I'm unable to grasp the potential. It's going to be huge. And, um, and, and uh, so that my, I'm very optimistic about the future. I think, again, it's going to be um, marked with tremendous growth, unprecedented growth. And the, my wish for Israel for the next 75 years is to be able to fully and successfully integrate all sectors within Israeli society. And I don't like when people use the word uh, tribes to describe uh, because, um, you know, the tribes, we're, we're talking about um, decentralization of uh, the world of information. So by definition, it's an endless number of echo chambers and what people call tribes. So I, I prefer, you know, looking at it as a as a joint effort, as a celebration, as a party, and we want other people to join the party. Celebration. Amen. May may it come to be soon. Ambassador Ido Aharoni, thank you so much for joining us. And please continue speaking out and uh being a real light for the world and for Israel. Thank you so thank much. Thank you for God having me. You. It's 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 been a pleasure. God bless you too. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Thank you for listening to the Conversations with Yael podcast. If you like what you have heard, please check out my weekly podcast, Nourish Your Biblical Roots, that explores the Jewish roots of the Christian faith with inspirational and ancient teachings. You can also visit me at mybiblicalroots.org for more of my teachings, videos, blogs, and books. Follow me on Instagram at Yael underscore Eckstein or on Facebook at Yael Eckstein. Shalom and see you next month.